Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your host for today's WJE webinar, Assessment and Conservation of Modernist Concrete. This presentation is copyrighted by West Jenny Elsner Associates. And now I will turn it over to Blake Andrews, who is our Associate Director and Manager of WJE's London office to review today's learning objectives, aims, and goals, and to introduce our speakers and today's topic. Blake? Well, thanks, Liz. <clears throat> I'd like to start by talking through the AA Continuing Education Provider Learning Objectives, of which there are four. Briefly explain the history of concrete and its importance, be able to detail challenges with conservation of these types of structures, define approaches for maintenance and repair of historic concrete, and be able to describe the investigation process. Similarly, the REBA aims and goals. There are four aims. Understand, again, the history of concrete and its importance, review common deterioration and distress, document building characteristics and condition, and review approaches to heritage concrete repair, including the various tasks. Similarly, the goals involve defining approaches for the maintenance and repair of concrete, identify inspection tasks, and be able to describe the investigation process. Before we begin, I want to give a very brief introduction to Wish Jane Ailsner Associates WGE to provide some context for the webinar. Again, briefly, we're a firm of engineers, architects, material scientists. Uh, our mission is to help clients solve, repair, and avoid problems in the built world. We focus on assessment, repair, rehabilitation of existing structures and enclosures of all kinds, as well as avoiding problems in new structures and enclosures through design review, design assist, and construction troubleshooting and monitoring. Uh, we were founded in 1956 in Northbrook, Illinois, outside of Chicago. Today, we have 750 or so employees, 29 offices in the United States, and one office in Europe in London, which we started in 2016. We are a multidisciplinary group of engineers and architects and material scientists, and we also have the Janney Technical Center, one of the largest commercial labs in the United States, where we do diagnostic testing on a variety of construction materials for the purpose of trying to avoid and help solve those problems. And the multidisciplinary nature, I think, is relevant to our webinar today, which is often a collaboration of structural engineering, architectural stroke facade engineering, architectural preservation, and then uh, <clears throat> concrete testing and, and material science. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our presentees, Paul Gadet, who is a principal level engineer working out of Chicago, and Ann Hare, who's an associate principal level engineer working out of Los Angeles. They will share their experiences, approaches, and case studies today on this topic. And while most of the case studies are for projects in the USA, the approaches are broadly applicable around the world uh, for concrete structures and concrete technologies of the last 100 plus years, and certainly in Europe, the UK and the USA. To you, Paul. All right. Thank you, Blake. Uh, thank you all for attending our presentation today. Um, concrete is often thought as a modern building material when compared to stone, wood, and masonry, but it really has a long history. Uh, two examples you are all probably familiar with are the Pont de Garde in France from the first century AD and the Pantheon, Pantheon from Rome, Italy in 126 AD. The Romans um, mixed lime and, and pozzolana and volcanic ash to produce hydraulic cement, cement capable of setting and hardening with the reaction in water. Natural cements composed of naturally occurring lime and clay were burned at a relatively low temperatures. This technique tended to have, of course, widely varying properties. In 1824, jo Joseph Aspen, an English mason, took out a patent on hydraulic cement that he called Portland cement because of its color resembled the stone quarry on the Isle of Portland off the British coast. Manufactured cements have a more controlled production are more finely ground at higher temperatures and are more, are more consistent, predictable product. As a result, natural cement production declined rapidly once manufactured cements were available. During the 1800s, um, the cement production and use really took off and construction of a system of canals in the first half of the 19th century created large scale demand for cement in the US. And shown at the Erie Canal um, from 1825. The first concrete street in the U.S. was Bell Fountain, Ohio, and was placed in 1891. And as typical of that time, the pavement was cast in two separate layers. The bottom load-bearing portion of the system was a lower cement content in, in more coarse aggregate, while the upper layer 
was a more cement rich layer, um, which at the time was a common technique to increase durability and waterproofness um, of the concrete. And in some cases and some references would even be called waterproofing. As in, as in the beginning, today's concrete is generally just a, 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 a combination of cement, aggregate, and water, plus some admixtures. Concrete differs from mortar in that it has coarse aggregate with a diameter of one to two centimeters or three eighths to three quarters of an inch. Um, and varying these amounts and types of the mixed components will change the flow, strump, uh, slump, strength, and durability, and very importantly, appearance. For new construction, ready mix concrete or site batch plants are typically used. Ready mix trucks have been common on sites for over 100 years, um, but often for repair work, or repair of facades, pre bagged or proprietary mixes um, are often um, used. And just to go with a little bit of history, um, is some of the early designers using reinforced concrete, um, and this is one of the more famous ones, is the Van River. Uh, the Vian Bridge designed by Francois Henenbeek and G.A. Weiss, um, who bought the Monier um, patents. And this was built in 1899 and was the longest spanning reinforced arch bridge of the 19th century. Now for today's talk, what we're mostly concerned about um, are buildings where the concrete is becoming a dominant component of the facade. Um, and, and this is, uh, I, I chose these two photographs uh, that show the differences between uh, the 20th century industrial and civil structures where you, you can just see the exposed edges of columns and slab edges as opposed to the brutalist building on the right where the concrete facade is, is the dominant feature of the building um, showing some of the mechanical systems and things of that nature. Some other uh, famous examples are Le Corbusier's uh, um, capital complex in Chandigarh, India. This is the Palace of Assembly and the Chief Secretary Office of Punjab um, in India. And you can see quite dramatic examples and uses of concrete, um, especially on the right, where you can see um, kind of a flexible uh, facade of shape, um, which would be very difficult to match. And Anne will talk about that in the second portion of the talk. Some other more uh, common examples that you can see from the 20th century um, where the facade became a more dominant uh, building material uh, chosen by architects and engineers for its flexibility and shape and aesthetics. Some good examples are the Johnson Wax Building in uh, Racine, Wisconsin by Frank Lloyd Wright in 1936, uh, the Promontory Apartments Building in Chicago by Mies van der Rohe in 1949, and the Salk Institute in La Jolla, California by Louis Kahn in the 1960s. Some more complicated examples are uh, Bertrand Goldberg's uh, Marina City Complex in Chicago, Illinois, um, which was a combination of, of a hotel, theater, skating rinks, parking garage, and residential structure. Uh, note that the facade and the balconies of the to towers are curved edges um, that really are the character defining feature of the building, but when it comes to the repair side, um, makes it more difficult. And even more difficult are uh, some of the Paul Rudolph buildings. Um, these, these happen to be from the UMass uh, University campuses, um, have very complicated shapes. Um, and, and on the uh, on the right photograph is an interior view of a board formed uh, finish with natural concrete with no coatings. And then raising to an even higher level, um, uh, which is this final example, is the Barbican Center in London built between uh, 1965 and 76. Um, it was designed by Chamberlain, Powell, and Bond, and, and the structural engineer, Europe. But this is a very complicated site of raised plazas, high rises, townhouses, um, fountains and other elements. And the brutalist buildings that are characterized here are a natural um, concrete exposed surface, which has to be matched or should be matched um, 
in its place. Um, and, and usually a coating is not used. And Anne will get a, a little bit more to that in her in her portion. So what what we wanted to do was develop um, an approach on how on how we approach buildings like this. Um, some good references um, that I wanted to identify, which are linked um, on the site, and you should have. Uh, this happens to be one by um, the English Heritage a Practical Building Conservation Series, um, and this one is on concrete. Um, but how do you how do you approach the repair of these structures? Uh, first. You want to work with the stakeholders to develop the goals for the project. Um, and, and typically, this will include developing a, a practical approach, an efficient approach, um, and deciding what, what are the uh, defining characteristics and what options are available and what should be evaluated um, approaching the project. The general goals are to repair the existing distress and deterioration with durable materials um, that match the existing elements. Um, you we really you want to establish procedures and standards of care for the technical and aesthetic qualities of the repair and the development of the mixed design placement procedures and finishing. Um, and Ann will discuss this um, in some mini case studies in the second half. Some additional links, um, some additional additional references that you may want to consider are shown here. Um, and, and once again, those are um, linked on, on what on your um, website. Um, some that I, two that I did want to point out um, are some recent references, are Conservation Principles for Concrete of Cultural Significance, uh, published by the, the Getty, and then also the Guidelines for Conservation and Concrete Heritage uh, that was recently published uh, by ICOMOS uh, by the International Scientific Committee of 20th Century. Once again, these are, these are linked uh, for you to uh, find. For older concrete, uh, for older reinforced concrete, determining the type of reinforcement can often be difficult to determine. Especially at the beginning of the 20th century, there was a variety of different reinforcement and reinforcement systems. Um, there were many shapes, sizes, uh, deformations that were used, and, and what shape of the reinforcement was better? What's the layout that worked best? What type of steel? Um, Today, steel reinforcement is now standardized to sizes and materials and strength and allows designers to select from a various types of reinforcement. So it's, it's much easier to determine what you have um, in the concrete today. A good reference for this is uh, Vintage Steel Reinforcement in Concrete Structures um, that was published by the um, CRSI um, and that, that is also linked um, to your page. One thing to consider also too in the um, development of your uh, approach is, is the conservation of concrete. Um, in today's world, um, it really needs to be thought of front and center and should be taken into consideration. It is a given that preservation and conservation are inherently uh, sustainability and sustainable practices are inherently compatible with conservation. But how much, to what extent? We understand the new codes will push this, re push reuse more efficient buildings and reduce waste, resulting in a more positive impact on health, safety, and community welfare. Uh, and I just, I, I wanted to pull up this um, example. This is the Miami Marine Stadium in Miami, Florida, uh, that was highly used when it was originally built in 1963. It was designed by the architect Hilario Candela, um, who recently uh, passed away. And, on, and, and, and for a little while it was used for a concert venue, um, but um, today it, it somewhat stands in, in, a, in a level of disrepair, uh, but hopefully this will be um, conserved. But I think it's a good example of, of the importance of sustainability. So understanding the benefits is the first step. Uh, we talked about some of those and usually this includes the cultural benefits, um, reduction in carbon, uh, sustainable, sustainable design, sustainable construction practices, and the inherent advantages of conservation. But, but how to achieve that? Um, how do you integrate sustainability into your conservation design? This can be accomplished by better construction techniques and materials, 
um, increased durability of repairs, protection of the concrete, um, and also monitoring of the concrete. All these things to increase the durability between the time and repair cycles. Um, and here are just two examples, a sculpture on the north coast of Spain and uh, the Tripoli International Fairgrounds uh, by Oscar Niemeyer in Tripoli, Lebanon. For the approach to concrete conservation, um, the first step is to develop an approach to con concrete conservation. This includes uh, to research cultural and technical significance, understanding the original construction techniques, um, identify the significant um, character defining features, determine causes of distress and de deterioration, and to understand previous repair work, and also to work in accordance with the governing entity requirements, to follow conservation precepts and to perform durable repairs. And, and um, this, this kind of flow a pattern of, of how to approach it is discussed in more detail in some of those references I provided, especially um, the, the guide by uh, the Getty and the one by um, ICE, uh, International Scientific Committee 20C. But here's the, um, this happens to be uh, uh, Eduardo Tarajo's uh, design of the uh, horse racetrack in Madrid, Spain, um, during, uh, as it's shown originally, on the top photograph. And then years later, um, after it was uh, um, rehabilitated and, and, and still is used today. So what are the defining characteristics of concrete? What is important and how will this be matched and affect the repair work? Um, there are architectural details um, which, which are infinite and, and variable but usually they have to do with fine details, finishes, board form finish, um, different mixes, which create different colors and expose aggregates, um, the reinforcement and construction techniques and the existing surface, which is undoubtedly, uh, will undoubtedly uh, have a variable appearance. And once again, Ann will discuss some of the techniques used to match this in the second half. The first step in the assessment of the concrete is to determine the, the causes for the decay and damage or deterioration. And this is usually characterized is in, in several different categories. Uh, the three um, dominant ones are usually material related deterioration, corrosion related, and then structural di distress. But you really can't overlook um, the, the problems caused during the original design and construction defects. Um, which really should be which really should be assessed. Um, also, there certainly has been uh, past repair projects, and and what is the condition of those? So basically, you have to perform another investigation of that component. And, and several times, there could be different um, repair campaigns have been performed. But just to, just to look at a couple of the items that. that you would look for the, the first one is probably cracking, um, which, which comes up really in anything that's concrete is usually there's some type of cracking that's involved. And how to define it can be uh, fairly difficult. But usually what you'll find are is, you know, cracking is a symptom of something else. On a concrete facade, shrinkage cracks are usually evident. Um, and you can see that on the left, a fairly fine crack um, associated with construction placement techniques. Um, or, or shrinkage during early, um, um, early, early curing. Some other techniques um, shown in the middle photograph has to do with a slab edge being poured and then a knee wall on top creating a joint, um, which which can cause moisture to enter a building, um, and that's a different type of crack. It's more of a joint, but it's a crack. The right photo shows um, deterioration due to corrosion of embedded reinforcing steel, uh, which has caused some severe cracking do the expansive forces created by the corrosion of the embedded reinforcing steel, uh, which undoubtedly will, would need to be repaired. Another, another common form of deterioration is freeze-thaw deterioration. And that occurs when concrete is critically saturated and then when it's exposed to cyclic freezing and thawing, and that's going above and below the freezing point, um, which is 30 degree, 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero centigrade, and it results in damage to the concrete. 
The level, of course, the level of freezing and thawing is dependent on the regional weather and exposure. Um, so if you're too far north, it, it won't be a problem. If you and then if you're in that middle area where you're constantly above and below the freezing point and, and moisture is available, that's usually uh, where it becomes the biggest problem. In today's world, um, air entrainments used, uh, which greatly increases the durability of concrete in a freeze-thaw environment. Uh, but but most of the structures we're talking about today uh, do not have that admixture. And then the most dominant one that we see um, usually is the is a corrosion related deterioration. And, and use, that is a combination of water, oxygen and exposure to the embedded reinforcing steel that can result in corrosion of the embedded reinforcing steel. Um, this is made worse by carbonation. Uh, which reduces the pH or alkalinity of the concrete or a, a or and a high chloride content. The expansive forces created by the corrosion of the embedded reinforcing steel cracks the surrounding concrete, eventually, eventually causing it to spall away and expose the reinforcing steel. And this shows you an example of, um, we start out with a a concrete column at the corner. You can see cracks on both sides. Um, and as we start to pull away some of the loose concrete, it, it spalls away at the expansive component um, from the, the rust, which is caused by the corrosion process. And then eventually the whole skin or um, covering layer of concrete was removed, exposing all the corroded reinforcing steel. One of the more challenging components is um, uh, to do, to uh, repair has to do with um, previous repairs, especially if they weren't uh, performed as well as they could be. Um, in in, that, in today's world, we will you will come across this this problem. Should it be removed? Um, should it be replaced? What is the service life remaining? All these are important subjects. And what is the performance? And, and oftentimes, it's using an aesthetic decision. But usually we look, um, what we look for is what is the surface preparation that was originally used? What were the, re what were the uh, repair materials and, and how is it protected at this life? And then based on that, you have to make a judgment on the surface life. And is it an irreversible repair? Is, is the concrete been damaged? Um, and, and probably the hardest one decision to make is if it, if it looks um, terrible if, if it doesn't match at all, but it's it's performing well, like from a from just a purely concrete point of view, um, is it left in place or is it taken out? And these are not easy questions um, with regards to repair work. Now I'm going to pass it over to our second speaker, um, Anne here. Anne. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is really kind of the process of, the, you know, weighing all the variables and considerations and the development of an approach for the conservation of, you know, a modernist structure, a heritage concrete structure. And really the, the first step in that is understanding what you have and that you do that through an assessment. And of course, this developing the approach and the assessment is multi-phased. But the very first step in really any project is doing some research, um, especially for heritage concrete structures, gathering information and research is really critical. And this can be from newspaper articles. This can be, you know, photographs from during construction. And really, this is an opportunity to understand the significant characteristics or importance of the structure and also try and get a sense of the original construction. Um, with concrete, obviously, that means the mixed design. Um, how was the concrete placed? Where did the concrete come from? What was the formwork? Um, and are there, re you know, can we find information on the reinforcement? Obviously, this can be fairly tricky with heritage structures um, to have all documents available to get all this information. One thing that's also important to understand at the start of any project is really what is the period of significance with a heritage concrete structure understanding that. And what you see here, this is the John Anson Ford Theater in Los Angeles, California. 
Um, and this theater, it's exposed, it's open air, and you can see that there are, you know, the towers on either side of the stage are painted, um, that there are coatings on these on these walls. Um, and that's what this, you know, structure looked like when we started the process of determining what the approach was going to be for conservation. However, once we started doing some research and we looked up historic photographs, it was determined that originally it was an uncoated structure. So during, you know, in working with the entire project team and all of the stakeholders, it was determined that the structure being uncoated was the period of significance. And we needed to weigh this as, you know, considerably as we developed any approach to conservation and move forward with the project. So after the research is done, the next step in understanding, you know, the structure as is and developing the baseline for the conservation um, or repair approach is the assessment in the field. And this, you know, is something that is done by experienced and trained professionals with, you know, similar structures with concrete. And it's really the opportunity to get an understanding of the as-built condition as well as all of the characteristics. And what you see here is really a bullet list, kind of an outline um, that I'm gonna talk through of kind of each step for, uh, an infield assessment supplemented with laboratory um, studies and structural analysis if necessary. But this is really the opportunity to gain the information that feeds the decisions during the development of a repair approach. The visual survey, this is, you know, kind of the, the part really, it's the opportunity to look and understand the structure what are not only what are the significant components and character defining features and those architectural characteristics that make the you know a, a modernist structure you know where the concrete is the architectural detail what are those architectural details and what is considered to be important um also is there a coding or a protection system there if we think back to you know the theater where we started that project there was one there it's also the opportunity to look at previous repairs, as Paul was talking about, um, but also get a set, you know, where are the cracks? Where are the spalls? Is there deterioration and, and types and locations of that? Trying to get a sense and gathering all of this information, because again, this is going to feed all of the decision-making process for the repair approach. At the start of a visual assessment, you know, you want to look at the big picture, the holistic view of the building. And that's what I'm showing you, you know, really on the left, step back, understand the structure as a whole. But then you also have to get up close and personal and look at all of those, you know, cracks on the building to determine, you know, do they need to be addressed? Why are the cracks there? You know, Paul talked about, you will see cracks, um, but really having a macro and a micro understanding of the project and the building is really important to move forward. Again, protection systems. Understanding the protection system that's on a building just from a visual survey can be really difficult. Um, again, you want to understand, is it was it part of the original design intent? Is it a contributor to the period of significance? Uh, how many layers of protection systems are there? You can see on the left, this is actually another photograph of the Miami Marine Stadium that Paul showed earlier, but you can see just the layers and the layers and the layers of all of the street art um, that is on this building versus, you know, again, multiple layers that were installed as part of protection systems or changes of aesthetics of a building during its use. It's also important to remember that sometimes these protection systems could be lead-based or have hazardous materials. So as it comes to you know, environmental sustainability, the removal and disposable, disposal of these materials really needs to be um, considered. Non-destructive evaluation is an approach to yield some more information on top of just the visual survey uh, without really having an impact or causing damage to the structure. There's several different tools and techniques out there to learn more about the structure without having to remove areas. Um, but you know, some of these are very low tech and others are very, very high tech. The most low tech method um, is acoustical sounding. And you know, I consider this 
should be part of a visual survey. It's so easy. It's so low tech. Um, and with concrete, it really does yield quite a bit of information about previous repairs, near surface defects, spalls, areas of delamination. It's a really, really handy tool that, is, again, is very low tech. From that low tech option, that's very easy and relatively inexpensive. There are much more high tech solutions such as ground penetrating radar or x-ray that allow you to look inside the building and identify where reinforcement is or potentially internal defects. And you know, there's even opportunities to determine corrosion rate potentials and get some information about the concrete materials itself without having to remove them using some of these really high tech tools. Obviously, all of these tools need to be done by experienced professionals. Um, the more high tech, the more experience. They also need to be calibrated. They need to be cross-checked. Um, you know, one doesn't want to just you know take a readout from a black box uh, as truth. Uh, it needs to be result confirmed, um, if you will. And so, one opportunity to confirm your NDE results is exploratory openings, and these should supplement any visual assessment or and or non-destructive evaluation. Um, and you know these can exploratory openings they can be relatively small or they can be as large as you need them to be but these are opportunities to yield information about hidden conditions that you may not have been aware of either from research the visual survey or even the nde that was done of course choosing where they're done on a heritage structure can be pretty tricky um, on one hand, you want to avoid the visibility of an exploratory opening. You don't want to do it within a, a primary character defining feature or architectural detail of significance. However, at the same time, you need to choose a location that's going to yield useful information in answering questions as you develop the conservation approach. So with heritage structures, like I mentioned, you know, Sometimes we don't have information as to the concrete materials or the reinforcement system. Um, and, you know, obviously in repairing of a concrete structure, having that information is going to be really important to make sure that the repair approach is compatible, as well as addressing deterioration mechanisms that are on the building. Um, so removal of concrete samples can help with this. Of course, you know, Yes, we're removing fabric, but really this can be considered non-destructive. Um, coring can be done in relatively small diameters, but then also sometimes there's loose concrete or materials or spalls that can be removed. You know, it's, it's already spalled anyways. <laughs> Taking that off can yield information as to the deterioration mechanism. And you can see that here in the, in the middle photo um, on the left. That's a piece of concrete that was just removed by hand that was a spall. Um, deter based on what information you need and potentially what laboratory testing will be done, that will also dictate the samples that you need to obtain. Um, once you have your samples, uh, these can be sent to a laboratory for petrographic and chemical studies. Paul mentioned earlier, you know, several deterioration mechanisms, laboratory studies, can yield information about those mechanisms of deterioration, including material related distress. It can also yield information about the concrete itself. Um, again, if there's no documents or information, the laboratory studies can give you information about the concrete. Sometimes these petrographic studies can be done in the field um, and that will give you some information. Again, it will be limited. Uh, the better the sample, um, and the more opportunity in the lab, the better the test results and the more information you will be able to have in the development of a, of a repair approach. Petrography is the visual and microscopic examination of concrete or um, to determine the mineral mineralogical and chemical characteristics. Um, Petrographic examination of hardened concrete is outlined in ASTM C-856, as well as BS-1881-211. And again, you know, these microscopic examinations can yield a lot of information about the concrete makeup, its characteristics, what the aggregate source is, um, as well as those deterioration mechanisms that are going to determine the repair approach. 
I want to touch, Paul mentioned carbonation earlier. You can see that here in the photo at the bottom. You know, a quick test in the lab with the addition of some, you know, phenolphthalein on a fresh surface, that can yield information about carbonation. What is carbonation? Carbonation happens when carbon dioxide um, enters the concrete from an exposed surface. That carbon dioxide reacts chemically with the existing concrete and actually reduces the alkalinity. When concrete is fresh, when it's brand new, it's very, very alkaline. The pH is very high. And that highly alkaline environment provides a passive protection for the embedded reinforcement or embedded metal. Once that pH reduces or the alkalinity reduces, you lose some of that passive protection. So on older structures that have been exposed, you know, have those, those beautiful exposed concrete architectural facades, you can get um, carbonation happening. So understanding where your carbonation is, where you have a reduced pH, obviously that's an important data point to have in developing a repair approach. And that can be done with laboratory studies. Supplemental laboratory studies could also include, you know, taking cylinders or cores to determine the compressive strength to aid in the, if there has to be a structural analysis done or um, uh, determining any repair approach that needs to be. Paul also really, you know, laid in the importance of understanding previous repair campaigns or previous repairs. He noted, you know, you can have something that aesthetically is not successful, and that's what we can see on the right, versus a repair that is aesthetically more successful, and that's what you see on the left, you can see with the arrow. However, understanding if these previous repairs are technically appropriate, are they sound, are they compatible, um, the service life, you know, for a sustainable structure, extending that repair frequency and the cycle of repair is really important. Um, to be sustainable. So you want to understand, are these repairs going to continue to be successful? Or as Paul mentioned, have a difficult decision in determining if the repair needs to be replaced. I'm now going to talk about the actual process of repair implementation. Um, because this is important to know as part of a repair approach, especially with historic and heritage concrete structures, um, you know, one thing is we want these repairs to be sustainable, long lasting and durable. So the repair approach itself needs to address the deterioration mechanisms and it needs to facilitate the repair to be um, well bonded and the repair itself to have a long service life as well as contribute to the extended service life of the building. So the really the basics of any sound durable repair approach starts with, you know, it really talks about these steps, removal of concrete, um, addressing any reinforcing steel, completing surface prep, installation of formwork, place and cure your concrete, do some quality control and sound test, and then you're all done. It sounds easy peasy, lemon squeezy, but when we're dealing with modernist concrete structures, it really can be quite challenging. And I'm, I'm gonna talk through that a little bit here as well. So again, that first step, you want to remove concrete, um, you know, to address the, the repair area, the deterioration mechanism. And with uh, heritage concrete, we don't want to remove sound concrete. Nobody likes to lose historic fabric, but you really do have to remove sound concrete to be able to address deterioration mechanisms um, that are there. So removing sound concrete to get all the way behind the bar is uh, critical and important. And you can see surface prep is ongoing here in the photo on the left. Reinforcement, sometimes supplemental reinforcement is needed. Um, you know, addressing the reinforcement that's there, whether it has loss of section, you need to uh, arrest any ongoing corrosion, but sometimes supplemental reinforcement needs to be added uh, because there may not be enough for a good mechanical bond of the repair material or because the existing reinforcement is just deteriorated. Uh, Want to address quite a little quickly, um, form and pour repairs are considered to be a premier installation method. Uh, with the form and pour repair, you can have a high quality material that are more compatible with typically the existing heritage concrete. In addition, 
especially with modernist concrete structures, you can you, you can replicate the original placement method, and that can help you achieve a similar finish and texture. So with these form and pour processes, you know, design of formwork is critical. Not only does it have to match the geometry or the details of the structure, it has to also withstand the pressure of fresh concrete going in and so that you don't have bulges or leaks or, you know, really failures. Quality control and consistency of the concrete is important. Here you see the place, the process of placement of concrete into a form and pour repair with the formwork there. Um, utilizing a spout, the concrete is able to be poured in and gravity is used to push the concrete to into the repair area. Sometimes, and you can see this on the right, external vibration is needed to make sure for consolidation purposes and make sure that the entirety of the repair area is filled with the repair concrete. Then once the concrete has been allowed to cure, the formwork is removed. Um, and here are two examples of how geometry of formwork was necessary to replicate the existing building. You can see just the undulations of the, of the existing structure around these windows um, had to be replicated with the formwork. It also matches the smooth finish of the existing concrete as well. Again, quality control, this is concrete. We need to make sure that there's stringent quality control, and this is a key component to really any success. The concrete, you know, you need to know that the concrete is consistent, that it maintains its workability, that we're achieving the design intent, the project intent. Um, and on the right, you can see a slump test is going on, but there's also additional test equipment there. And this is a typical setup for quality control um, during really any concrete placement. As I mentioned, uh, form and pour repairs are kind of the, uh, really what we consider the best approach for a durable and uh, as well as matching. Um, that doesn't mean that trial applied mortar isn't utilized. These should be considered for smaller locations, not overhead or vertical, because uh, achieving bond can be difficult. They can also be done um, to match, but the level of craftsmanship and quality control needs to be very, very high and very stringent in order for these to be durable and long lasting, as well as achieve a match to the finish and texture of the existing concrete. And of course, protection systems, um, you know, if there was one on the building, you may be installing one again if that was part of the period of significance. However, if there wasn't one, you may want to consider one. And I'll talk about that through a case study. But these protection systems include sealant at joints and cracks to prevent water intrusion, penetrating sealers, installation of concrete coatings or balcony membranes. And with concrete, quality control and installation method are really important here, as well as aesthetics need to be considered, not just color, but sheen and texture and the impact that will have on the overall aesthetic of the building. A really, really quick case study. Uh, this is a brutalist building in an urban environment. As you can see, our favorite non-aesthetic successfully repair here, previous repair, lots of areas of deterioration uh, had to be addressed. The building had uh, these ribs, these textured ribs that had a wood grain exposure, and we knew that we would have to match and replicate this. And we did that through trials and samples and mock-ups, um, which you see on the right. Some of these repair areas were very large just due to the, ex you know, the rate of corrosion and the extent of the corrosion of the existing reinforcement. So, you know, Concrete had to be removed and that corrosion had to be addressed. The deterioration mechanism had to be addressed. Cleaning all areas of the bar, coating it with a corrosion inhibiting coating um, was critical as part of this project. The design of the formwork, you know, was necessary in order to complete the form and pour repairs as well as to replicate those ribs. Um, and it's, you know, a, a wood to have a wood, visible wood grain that would replicate the texture was, ne was really necessary on this, as well as just the geometry. Once the concrete cured, the formwork came off and you can see, you know, the entirety of this large repair area is infilled with concrete. You will also notice that while we match the texture and the geometry here, the color doesn't match. And that is because it was determined that due to the exposures 
and deterioration mechanisms that a protection system, even though one hadn't been on the building before, one was going to be considered. And so that assessment process started with looking at various types of systems, uh, colors of systems in both shade and sun and a wet and dry environment. And ultimately as part of the project, you can see here on the left, just the extensive areas of ongoing repair work. And then on the right, repair work is ongoing, but the coating system just to the right of the arrow um, was installed. And ultimately that was determined to be appropriate for this building to extend its service life to be sustainable um, and you know, really the most appropriate approach given all the variables and all the, you know, weighing all the impact from all the various uh, stakeholders that was considered. But with modernist structures, you know, all of those beautiful examples that Paul showed, you know, these modernist structures oftentimes don't have protection systems. They don't have anywhere to really hide. We have to match texture, color, exposed aggregate, finish, the variability. And what I mean by variability is just all of those imperfections on the concrete surface that do become part of the architectural detail, the finish, those, those characteristics that are character defining um, that you determine during your assessment and, and matching imperfections uh, using modern materials and modern techniques is really a challenge while achieving a good, sound, durable repair. Cleaning, um, you want to make sure that, you know, if you're matching, you're not matching dirt or soiling on the building. Uh, various trials are going to be really important. Gentlest means method or gentlest means possible. You don't want to damage the concrete surface in cleaning it. This can also, this can lead to more rapid soiling, um, but also loss of historic fabric and change of that finish and texture and loss of some of the characteristics of the concrete itself if you use an aggressive cleaning process. So how do we get there? How do we match these modernist concrete structures? Trial, it's trial and error. It's developing repair mix design with compatible material, compatible materials, and durable materials um, with you know durable construction methods, but just lots of trials, off-building trials, samples, and a stringent quality control process. So you start with the mixed design development. There's a shop sample phase of really looking at, you know, if you're looking at paste color or aggregate samples, um, doing those off building in the shop, then bringing those out to the field. And all of these off building samples, you're trying to replicate finish texture, but also placement method. These are opportunities for trial and error without having to affect the building. Um, so the more work you can do off building, the better. Uh, Finding a concrete color, this is not a quick process. Um, it can take quite a long, and the longer you have built into any project schedule for this, the better. Um, you know, concrete needs a minimum of 30 days to cure before you get a sense of the color. The longer you have, the better. But I've, I personally haven't seen anybody nail the color and the texture and the finish in the first try, so you will have multiple rounds. Um, and that's what you can see, you know, with these various systems, these various rounds, trying with the field samples, bringing them out and trying to match them on site. Again, another example of that, these off building samples. Once you have those samples, you compare them to the surface. And the photo on the right is a really good example of trying to match the imperfections, those bug holes, those character defining features that is architectural detail. It's inherent to the concrete itself. So again, trying to match these imperfections, perfectly matching imperfections is very challenging um, and takes a high level of craftsmanship. But ultimately with these modernist concrete structures, you can achieve sound, durable, sustainable repairs that do match aesthetics. All three of these are close-up examples on buildings. Um, and you can see these arrows are delineating where the repairs are and they do blend in. Um, you don't see them and they are sound and durable and you can achieve an, accept, an acceptable match to the building that is appropriate for the building and acceptable to all stakeholders. So in conclusion, you know, these modernist structures, they are part of our communities. They're everywhere and, you know, as part of being sustainable, we need to preserve and conserve all of these structures. However, 
just the inherent nature of these, the architectural detail of these creates challenges due to the characteristics, the exposure of concrete, concrete being an architectural detail in itself is a challenge. So therefore, repair of these heritage and modernist concrete structures is much more challenging than conventional concrete repair, although you need to use conventional concrete repair practices to achieve sound and durable repairs that will be sustainable. Collaboration and experience of the project team are critical, and there is absolutely no substitute to craftsmanship of the contractor. And again, every approach is going to have to be tailored to, every, to each project, depending on the building itself, as well as all the stakeholders involved. Um, and with that, I'm going to conclude this part of the presentation and turn it back over to Blake for questions and if there are any questions. Well, thank you, Anne <clears throat> and Paul. Great presentation. We, uh, but we've got a few questions. I'm going to try to aggregate them, and they have to do with color and texture. Uh, and, and the questions here are, is there maybe a specific method? And you touched on some of this the last few slides. Is there a specific method with choosing this design that can help you sort of uh, understand the color and texture? Uh, are there any methods to that? And then secondly, you know, how long, you mentioned 30 days is the minimum, but practically how long can you, do you need to wait to see the final concrete color and also the final coating color? Uh, there are a few questions to that point, Ann and Paul. Hey, Ann, I could, I could start out with that one. Is I think um, usually, uh, you want to build in this time to your project schedule. Um, there's nothing worse than waiting for something to cure and change color, uh, but the, the longer time you have, the better off you are. A couple things to consider is in the, the type of color you're trying to match. If something's buff um, or a tan color, that's usually harder to match. Um, uh, it, it's just more difficult to match that color as opposed to a a whiter gray, um, that that field of colors is usually a little bit easier. Also, um, depending on the surface texture uh, that you're trying to match, if it's if there's exposed aggregate, um, that can usually be easier to match because that color stays the color it is. It, it does not take time to cure out and change color. Um, but but all these variables come in come into play. Um, you want assessing colors, but I personally like to wait a little bit longer um, and, and make sure your samples are outside. Oftentimes, you know, putting them on the putting them on the roof, um, you know, getting as much exposure as quick as you can um, is a good idea. And did you have a uh, something you wanted to add? Yeah, Paul, I think the I totally agree with you. The longer you have built into the schedule, the better. Um, you know, watching concrete cured you know, it will continue to cure past 30 days and you will potentially, depending on the mix, see changes. Um, I think it is important to also consider the aesthetics in the shade, in the sun, wet, dry. Um, and, you know, if you have exposed aggregate versus a perfectly flat, smooth formed surface, that will impact the aesthetics as well. Um, a little bit and you know when considering aesthetics you do want to stand back a bit you don't want to be you know right up close and personal you need to stand back and really consider how the building is going to be viewed um during the during that process of, of determining the right repair mix and finish techniques to achieve an aesthetic match hey uh, i wanted to add one thing is um in the uh, list of questions like is uh nikki lauder from historic england um, added a, a comment and thank you, Nikki, um, regarding some references. Uh, you, one of them was Concrete Quarterly um, that's been published since 1947 as a good resource. And another one from the uh, Concrete Society Technical, building, uh, Technical um, Report 70, which includes um, some information on um, concrete and steel strength um, in the past. And um, also, there's some information from Concrete Society on closing concrete in the UK um, to, to 1934. And thanks for that, Nikki. Back to you, Blake. Well, th well thanks, Paul uh, and Ann. Uh, maybe a next uh, topic has to deal with bond. And two things here. How do you ensure bond of uh, the patch, the repair material to the substrate, especially considering differential shrinkage of a new material to an old? And where does reinforcing and dowels come into that? 
Yeah, I, I could I could take that. What one thing um, we've learned over time is when something when you're relying on bond only, that sometimes can can be a problem um, because then you do have to be extremely concerned about um, compatibility issues. Um, but even if you're reinforcing or mechanically attaching your repair, you still have to be um, concerned about that. But I think the idea is to use simpler materials. Um, you know stay away from the higher strength materials uh, we, and try and match the existing concrete as close as closely as what's reasonably possible. Certainly if it's a concrete that's got a problem um, inherent with it, you don't want to match that inherent problem, but um, you definitely um, don't want to go after the real high strength materials uh, with this is, is to keep things simple um, and do the best surface preparation you can, which is really where the bond comes from. And that's concrete to concrete. However, you also want to um, uh, you, you also want to mechanically attach it. Um, and once again, I think the the use of mortars sometimes can be challenging. Um, sometimes they're they they can be a little bit more brittle and and can fracture more easily and and debond away from the edges. There, there's all kinds of things that that come with trying to use a trowel. Uh, to install in layer uh, mortars, especially if you're stacking them um, every few centimeters, you're putting on another layer. Um, Ann, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think that's, um, you got it, Paul. Okay. Well, thanks both. And uh, we've talked a little architectural piece. We've talked a little bit of bond structural, shall we say. Let's move a little bit to mixed design. Um, are there any specific things that you would look at in a bag mix design that maybe uh, would be sp specific to heritage and dealing with older concrete, including maybe different levels of absorption of new repair concrete and older original concrete. Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, you do. I, I, those are all very good um, points. And the going back to um, what, what Ann and I had mentioned earlier is I think it, it, compatibility is a is a very important component. Is to not to keep your mixes as simple as you can um, is always a good idea, but also not, um, you know, sometimes the use of, of polymers and the use of uh, other admixtures um, can create a, a, a quite a difference in absorption. Um, and especially during rain, uh, those become very evident where the original material will, will darken with moisture while the repair material will stay um, brighter. And, and that is a problem. Um, and, and you may want to be a little bit careful about your your um, your your admixtures. Uh, for instance, like if you're using a an acrylic or latex modifier in your mix, you, you may want to consider not doing that. But it, it, each mix has to be designed for the project, as Ann had mentioned um, before. Yeah, I think there's technical considerations as well. You know, obviously compressive strength, um, and and it does depend on the extent of the repair. Um, compressive strength, modulus of elasticity, these other types of technical considerations that we would consider for any type of concrete repair. Um, and then, you know, as Paul mentioned, on top of it, you know, how are we going to bond to the existing concrete there? Is the concrete that's there lightweight or normal weight aggregate? Like that comes into play as well. Um, and not just during rain, how does the the absorption look, but that absorption will also indicate how the repair will age, the dirt pickup. Um, you know, so ultimately, if you have a, an urban environment where dirt pickup is considerable, a repair that doesn't absorb, um, it it may show or it may, you know, it may match one day and then later on it aesthetically it doesn't match because it's not. Um, soiling at the same rate as the adjacent concrete. So those are all things to keep in mind. Um, and again, you know, every project is going to be different. Thanks, Ann. Uh, this will be the last question since we're getting up to four o'clock here, UK time. And by the way, I believe we'll be answering these questions via email subsequent if we didn't get to it. And yet again, switching gears here for the last question, what type of specific data must be collected from the building, from the general contractor through the repair process that it can be referred to for future repairs. And dear I say, we might call this a golden thread of information nowadays in England. 
It's a great question because I think this is important just in terms of making, you know, the next re- whoever's doing the next repair campaign, making their lives easier because there are going to be lessons learned from the repair of a historic structure that, you know, what was the mixed design? How was it formed? What was the brand of formwork or the type of wood? How was it attached? Really all of those details that gets worked out during the mock-up phase um, and really adds to the level of craftsmanship for the building to make it successful having that treasure trove of information so that you're not starting from, you know, really scratch, but you're, you know, there's still going to be a learning curve for a next repair campaign Um, that will happen. You know, just with these repairs, we want to extend the the frequency of those repair campaigns, but, you know, it's not just the mixed design. It's not just, you know, the materials that were installed, but also what were those tips, tricks, techniques, Um, anything that was done to really replicate is going to be important. But also, you know, when it comes to the material, you know, the sources of the aggregate, the sources of the cement, because that could help in terms of matching at a later date, but really also understanding the full picture of what was done. I I had some final comments too. I had, there's like three or four kind of golden rules. And and, and Anna and I work a lot together on different projects and, and I think she'll agree is I is those three or four rules are um, that, that I are guiding principles I guess that I, I look for are um, mock-ups I, I, I just can't emphasize how important they are and, and sometimes in the past when I've skipped those I've always always regretted it um, because of some mis- misunderstanding or, or problem downstream um, the, the next is uh, is there there's just no substitute for craftsmanship um you know certainly the the 10th time someone does some high level of, of repair techniques they're better than the first time um in in the way we we could, we judge craftsmanship is um is concrete repair is is one level um and, and those are the good principles the next level may be architectural and then the highest level is is heritage concrete, um, w- which is what we were talking about today. It is the most difficult. It is the most challenging, um, especially with the variability components. There, there's just no substitute for it. Um, but, but those are probably the biggest lessons learned um, over time. That if, that if we could suggest some things that um, for people to do, th- those are it. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, that'll close out Q&A. And thank you for all for coming. You can read the instructions on the screen that will see, receive an email uh, with their certificate. And also we'll be responding to those Q&A. So thank you again for coming and have a great day.